now. Okay. Well, hey, thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump into it and just do a brief introduction of our companies. So Lauren and I work for Providence Consulting, uh, now a Trinity Consultants company. And Providence has been delivering process safety solutions to all kinds of industries for going on 15 years now. Um, our core lines of service are mechanical integrity, relief system design, PHA facilitation, and PSI management. Uh, but over those 15 years, we've really built up solid expertise in each element, and consequently, we really understand how those pieces fit together and to leverage them efficiently. Now, if you want to know, know more details about what we do, hey, just reach out, and we'd be happy to have uh, a conversation with you. And I'll let uh, Micah introduce CMC. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Tom Masiel Carey, we are a, a small boutique law firm um, with practices focused exclusively on workplace issues. So we have uh, labor and employment, workplace safety, and uh, litigation groups to uh, help employers uh, with their workplace needs and challenges. Uh, we've got a strategic focus uh, in the way we provide legal services, uh, and we, we manage everything from the the day-to-day -day employment counseling and uh, workplace safety advice all the way through um, managing complex litigation related to uh, disasters or, or other significant issues. Um, we, we always try to focus on uh, creative ways of solving problems uh, rather than uh, following the typical path of dragging things into litigation whenever possible. So um, we we have a, a, one of the largest teams. I think we'd say it's the, the largest team of lawyers exclusively focused on workplace safety and health, and so um, we're, we're always happy to help out our clients with uh, their needs. All right. Thank, thanks, Micah. <clears throat> so just a little bit of overview here. Uh, we'll, we'll start by setting the table with a bit of background and timing, uh, and then Micah will lend us his expertise on OSHA and EPA memos and establishing good faith from a legal perspective. And then, and then we're going to jump into our recommended approach on how to establish good faith within your PSM and RMP programs. And so we'll talk about some elements from a higher level, but we also want to provide something a bit more meaningful in application. And so Lauren will take a really in-depth approach on leveraging a risk-based process. And then we'll take it back to a 10,000 foot level and talk about what can be done in the virtual environment. Now, Lauren and I spent some time mapping out good faith efforts for each element to sort of a checklist. Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to have time to address all the elements today. Uh, but because we appreciate you attending and we feel that this is important, we want to arm you with that information so that, number one, your facilities are well protected, and then number two, uh, so you have to have a document or a sort of roadmap to demonstrate your good faith efforts uh, should that need arise. And so we'll deliver a COVID-19 good faith checklist to you within a week or so of this webinar. Uh, and what we are hoping is that this webinar sparks some ideas that you can share back with us so that we can incorporate that into the checklist and make it even better. Um, all right, so here is the timeline of events. Like in January, we started to have a few cases of COVID show up in the US. We started to have a, a pattern of a case of COVID here, case of COVID there, and then we started to have some uh, clusters in February. And by, by the end of February and early March, we we're starting to see some booms in some areas of the country. Case, case, cluster, boom. And that pattern really prompted facilities to start pandemic preparation plans, some of them implementing earlier than others. But regardless, it just wasn't much time to prepare. And so by March 13th, a national emergency was declared. March 26th, the EPA announces its enforcement discretion policy. And then on April 16th, OSHA follows suit and issues its enforcement memo. And now look, we recognize that we're starting to come out of these mandated shutdowns right about now, maybe for a month or so, at least temporarily. We recognize that this webinar may be a little bit late related to the memo releases. However, we still think it contains valuable information for two primary reasons. Number one, ensuring a good faith efforts uh, that were implemented and well documented and cover everything that you need to prevent citations. And then number two, you know, what happens if we get a second wind of this? Let's nail that thing down from the start. Um, so that's kind of the purpose. So with that, I'll hand over to Micah to discuss the members. Thanks, Dylan. All right, so I'm sure everyone here uh, is familiar with the terms um, uh, PSM and RMP. 
uh, but we'll just do a quick refresh to make sure we're all working from the same baseline. Um, these two programs uh, that OCEAN EPA have are very similar in some ways, but there are some important distinctions. Uh, the first of which is, is the focus, who, who is being protected by the, the programs. OSHA's rule is focused on protecting employees, essentially inside the fence line of the facility. Uh, EPA's rule is, is focused on protecting outside the fence line, protecting the public at large and as well as the environment. Um, I think for most of our presentation here, we'll, we'll focus on the parts of um, RMP that are similar to PSM. As, as you know, um, RMP program level three is essentially equal to um, OSHA's PSM standard with a, a few uh, differences after we had the, the, the fun excursion with the new RMP rule and the rollback, we're now just about to, to level, but uh, with a few differences out there. So we'll focus most on the program level three, but of course um, there are um, two other levels, program level one, program level two, that have some different uh, lesser requirements for RMP. So um, those are some other things that are out there. You may be wondering why we're not touching on those. Uh, it's just because they're uh, not, they don't share as much in common with OSHA's PSM standard. Uh, the last difference to focus on here is um, the interactions with the agency. Uh, with OSHA's PSM rule, you'll hear from OSHA if you have an employee complaint, an explosion, some kind of problem. Um, otherwise, you're not going to have much input from the agency about how you're doing. Uh, on the EPA side, uh, you of course have the, the responsibility, if you have an RMP covered process, to actively report your compliance information at least every five years. There's a little more interaction there. Um, we'll touch on how, how that um, is affected uh, in I think the next slide. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, uh, as Dylan mentioned, in late March, EPA, uh, in response to the uh, pandemic, issued a, uh, a discretion policy. Um, it's important uh, for both EPA and, and OSHA purposes during this presentation to, to focus on what, what they're doing here. This really deals with enforcement discretion. Uh, there are no new rules. There are no changed rules. Uh, PSM is what it was before. RMP is what it was before. Um, this is uh, when we get to enforcement discretion. We're really talking about uh, the same situation. If a police officer pulls you over for doing 76 in a 70, they don't have to write you a ticket. They certainly can, but many times at that level, they'll use their enforcement discretion and say, you know what, slow down. I'm not going to do the paperwork. Um, we're, we're in a similar situation here. Um, EPA, uh, in, in their memo, they uh, recognized uh, all of the potential neg negative effects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and, and recognized that if facilities might have a hard time uh, complying with the letter of the law in the same way that they do during normal times. So they, they opened that up and, and recognized that, and, and that's the basis for their, their enforcement discretion. But the last point on this slide is the key one. Um, is that um, the EPA expects all regulated entities to continue to manage and operate their facilities in a manner that is safe and that protects the public and the environment. So this is the this is the big caveat. Uh, EPA says, hey, well, you're you're going to get some enforcement discretion. We're going to cut you some slack. We're not going to hold you to the wall, uh, but you have to operate safely. So the way I read that uh, is that. Um, if, if you have a, a release, if you have an explosion, if you have an incident, um, you should expect um, a, a lot less discretion from the agency. So you need to balance these two things. You've got a little bit extra room to work, but be careful, don't uh, make sure nothing bad happens. All right, so the, the first bullet here is um, related to routine compliance monitoring and reporting. This is the element of RMP that, that is, is dissimilar from PSM. There are a significant number of reporting requirements, some of them even outside RMP related to Title V and, and some water things as well. Um, if COVID-19 is the cause for late reporting and you can provide supporting documentation to the agency, EPA will not seek fines. You might get a, a notice of violation, um, but they're, they're not going to issue uh, fines if you can uh, demonstrate that, that you were late because of a COVID-19 reason. Um, outside the, the reporting and monitoring elements, uh, EPA expects their facilities to make good faith efforts to comply. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but basically to do what you can as fast as you can and ultimately whenever you're able to return to compliance that you, that you do that. Um, 
Now, if you're not able to comply, then um, EPA notes that they'll consider um, circumstances to determine whether uh, enforcement is appropriate given all of that. Uh, moving to the next slide, then the uh, the policy really they they give a, a pretty good guideline for how they're going to assess um, employer actions during this time. If it turns out the compliance is reasonably practical, practicable, which is one of those squishy words that uh, can be hard to figure out what it is, um, but if it's not reasonably practical, practicable, um, here's what facilities should do. Number one is act responsibly. Um, under the circumstances, do what you can to minimize the effects of noncompliance. Number two, identify the specific nature and dates. So uh, this isn't just if, if you accidentally fall out of uh, compliance and you're not really aware of it, uh, the agency is probably going to take a dim view on that um, because you know they're they're expecting expecting heightened awareness. Even if you can't fully comply, you need to be paying close attention to whether you are in compliance or not. Um, you need to identify for the agency how COVID-19 was the cause of the non-compliance. So if you've been late on your uh, mechanical integrity items, if your, your, your inspections are all past due uh, and you, you end up with an EPA inspection in the middle of the pandemic, uh, you probably are not going to be able to claim the pandemic is the cause of, of that um, non-compliance, right? There's got to be that linkage. Um, and so they also want to see documentation uh, related to what you did in response to that. And of course, as we said before, return to compliance as soon as possible and document, document, document. So um, that's that's a pretty pretty decent outline of, of how they'll look through it and, and, and a good path through you know, how you should think of your, your EPA compliance and how to use their enforcement discretion memo. Shifting over to the, the OSHA side, OSHA was a little later um, in issuing their enforcement discretion policy. And when they did it, they also issued it um, uh, to to be industry wide. So their April 16th memo covered all industries, not just PSM covered entities. This is um, this is everyone. So similar to uh, EPA, they acknowledged that th there were um, unprecedented issues that um, were arising, uh, and that there was a particular particular um, obstacles to uh, meeting regulatory obligation for um, very time-focused uh, requirements. Specifically, they, they talk about uh, annual training, audits, testing, medical surveillance, and, and the like. Um, and in addition, the whereas EPA focused on uh, employers' inability to comply with, with RMP, OSHA really focused on the balancing act that employers are doing. Because OSHA is a workplace safety uh, entity, not just a process safety management uh, enforcement entity, um, they are responsible for for, for not um, forcing employers to create workplace safety hazards by compliance with other um, other requirements. So OSHA in this memo acknowledged that uh, part of keeping work, um, part of keeping employees healthy and safe during a pandemic is making sure that we are taking um, the actions needed to to keep them from contracting the, the disease and passing it on to their coworkers. So that's you, you see this balancing act. OSHA is very cognizant of that um, in in explaining their enforcement discretion. So um, just like EPA, they talk about um, you know they're going to relax enforcement when compliance is infeasible. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we talk about some of the the framework that um, OSHA is going to use, and it's going to be very similar to EPA's, though they're going to use uh, slightly different words. They say if the employer is unable to comply with a standard that has um, annual or recurring uh, requirements, again they've given these examples of audits, reviews, training, assessments, inspection, or testing because of COVID-19. And if the employer made good faith attempts to comply, uh, OSHA will take that into um, strong consideration in determining whether to cite a violation. Um, there's not a lot of certainty there. They'll take your efforts into strong consideration and decide whether to cite you or not. Um, so there's there's their discretion enforcement laid out there, but they also highlight that um, if you can't demonstrate that you've uh, made any efforts to comply or if you can't demonstrate why complying uh, raises um, issues of um, or, or raises the specter of um, hazards of employees contracting coronavirus or anything like that, then you may be cited anyway. Um, and just like EPA, OSHA expects um, everyone to return to um, compliance as soon as possible, as soon as normal operations resume, et cetera. All right. 
Now, moving on to um, the, the assessments, what, what is OSHA going to be looking for? Um, some of the things that they list in the discretion policy is they want to see documentation, just like EPA, uh, of what you did to try to comply. So things that will be very important to keep, to, to documentation to create and to keep, um, contracts or invoices showing that you had a plan to comply, right? If you had um, training uh, by an uh, outside trainer scheduled for April, you should have a contract or an invoice showing that that had been scheduled, that you were going to be on time even before the outbreak occurred. Uh, similarly, uh, if you've got emails, any kind of communications with your providers um, talking about the reasons for the cancellation. Maybe you had a, um, a stay-at-home order or there were um, statewide restrictions that meant that you couldn't invite guests on site or a corporate policy that said that. Hopefully, you communicated that to the provider via email. Alternatively, many providers, um, their employers, um, were restricting um, um, trainers and, and other folks' ability to travel. So you may have gotten an email from them saying, hey, we have to cancel because we can't be on site. Uh, and the last piece here is documentation of good faith efforts to explore other options. So um, did you, it, it's fine if you had training scheduled and it was definitely canceled because of, of COVID-19, but did you explore whether there were other options? Could you do the training remotely? Um, one of the things that we've heard from OSHA talking this through with them is, hey, um, we're going to work with employers uh, we don't want to punish people for trying to do the right thing. But you can't just throw up your hands and say pandemic and think you're not going to get cited for something. Um, you, you've got to demonstrate that you did your best. And one of those um, elements is going to be showing that you pursued other options. So remote training uh, or, or some kind of um, remote virtual substitute for what was going to be happening. So those will be key things to keep. Um, all right, so I think we've got here, uh, another thing that's important is going to be um, if you are, not only are we documenting that we, we tried to, to find substitutes, but also um, if there was an ongoing hazard that existed, um, even though we were trying to substitute or do some other things, what did we do with that hazard? Um, if a hazard re remained, um, they'll be looking for what you've done to implement interim alternative protections, right? So maybe maybe uh, we had people that couldn't receive full training. Uh, you, you couldn't give a, a, a forklift driving test, right? And, and so we couldn't assess uh, employees' ability to, to drive forklifts safety, safely. All right, did you implement an administrative control uh, to ensure that uh, those people who had the, the substitute test didn't use forklifts in crowded areas or, you, you know, what was the, what did you do to, to deal with the physical hazards that were out there? Uh, and so whatever your area of noncompliance is, it may have, it, it may have no relation to specific physical hazards or it may be very closely tied to specific physical hazards. So they're looking for um, you know, what you did to, to, to substitute to, to deal with those physical hazards um, while the pandemic was ongoing. Um, all right, so then OSHA gave a, a good list of examples um, of things that are going to be covered by the, their uh, enforcement discretion policy. Most of these things, as you'll see on the list, are, are non-PSM, uh, but we did include them here because um, in the absence of specific PSM examples, we try to analogize um, to the examples that they provide. All right, so you see the first uh, six elements here. Um, you can look through those. If you if you pay close attention, you'll notice that all of these items, uh, as I said before, are very time specific. Um, they are not. This is not an OSHA obligation that is triggered. Uh, because of a specific hazard, a new hazard that has developed or been introduced in the workplace. Instead, these are recurring requirements. So you have to do an annual audiogram, not because you have a new, um, a, a new um, hearing hazard in your workplace, but because um, you have some ongoing hazards or you have employees with hearing loss. So remember, one, one thing to, to keep in mind when thinking about OSHA's enforcement discretion is that they are very focused on those things that there is a somewhat arbitrary timeline for compliance. Every year you have to do X or every five years you have to do Y. Those are the things that they're looking um, very closely at that, that they think will fit into the enforcement discretion. And you see some of the examples 
uh, that were provided um, for PSM in the memo, um, they, they match that perfectly. PHA revalidations, it's on a five-year cycle. It's not related to anything specific happening in the process. It's just five years from the last one. Same thing for your annual review and certification of operating procedures and your um, uh, operator refresher training. So those are, are very clearly covered. Moving to the next slide, uh, we've, we've developed um, some We've been able to have some good discussions with um, the, the PSM team there at OSHA and talked with them about, all right, dig in deep. You, you gave us some examples, but what else can we know about um, PSM and how this enforcement discretion is going to be used? Um, it seems like OSHA is very clear that there are some, some other elements to be covered um, by the, the discretion memo. Uh, compliance audits, um, updates of SOPs, um, MI training gets looped in, and then of course closing PHA and, and audit recommendations. Now, this is, um, we're, we're gonna hit here, This we've got a list of elements that are generally not covered by the memo, and um, don't, don't be surprised when later on in the pr presentation we're gonna talk about a lot about how you can maybe take advantage of this memo for these elements, um, but let's begin with the, the, the clear statement that OSHA considers these things to be generally not covered by the memo because they are not specific time-based requirements unrelated to physical hazards, right? As I said before, PHA's compliance audits, three years, five years, unrelated to specific hazards in the workplace. Um, mechanical integrity inspections, those are time-based typically, um, but they may, they, they, are, they are much more closely related to a hazard. If you don't do your um, um, mechanical integrity inspections or tests frequently enough, you expect that there will be a hazard that could result in a release. And so OSHA expects you to, um, to look at those things and um, they're not automatically gonna jump to thinking that they should provide enforcement discretion for those items. Um, all right, they, they, um, so generally speaking, MOCs are not going to be covered. Uh, mechanical integrity will not be covered. Um, except we give this example of if you do have to shut something down, if you've got equipment shut down, it's fine if you fall behind schedule, but you need to show good faith getting back into compliance after resuming normal operations. All right, the last bullet here is um, the important one. Uh, this is contrary to what the, the guidance OSHA gave us, um, but it's the, the principle of the memo can apply to anything, but you're going to have a higher burden to show good faith for mechanical integrity and other safety critical elements. You're gonna to have to do a lot more work to demonstrate to OSHA that not only were you exercising good faith, but you've done enough interim um, alternative measures to keep things operating safely while you're um, technically out of compliance. So we're gonna spend a lot of time for the rest of the um, presentation talking about that. Um, I've got one more slide here um, to talk about, um, you know, how do you define good faith? I've said good faith probably a hundred times already in this presentation. What does it mean? How do you establish it? On the left here, we've, we've got some potential reference point, points because you, you can't just, uh, good faith doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, it's very dependent on the circumstances and, and, and what you're dealing with. So one option is you can pair, compare yourself to others. Are you doing things similar to others in your industry? Are, are you matching? Do you know that you're doing, you're doing as good as anyone else is doing for your mechanical integrity inspections? Um, if you are, then, then that's important. You can, you can show that. That's one good reference point. Um, another option is just to demonstrate the limit, limitations to compliance. So instead of comparing yourself uh, to others, compare yourself to what's possible. Maybe there are local um, uh, restrictions um, uh, from the state or local government that put limits on your ability to comply. You can reference that. CDC guidance on best practices on keeping employees separate. That's very relevant. It may be preventing you from complying strictly. Uh, the same is true if you've got un unavailable contractors or other service providers. You can um, reference those as a, a reference point for your uh, non-compliance. Um, you can also uh, compare to your practices in pre-COVID times. So maybe you were doing X and now we're doing X minus 10% uh, because of COVID. If you show that you know we're, we're actually pretty close to how we normally do things, uh, and look at all the efforts we're making to, to get to that X minus 10%, um, that can be a good baseline that you can offer up to the regulator in, in uh, saying that you know, you're know you demonstrating good faith. Um, then on the right, we've got the, the limitations. Here are the things that can bite you. 
as I said before, there's no specific definition of good faith. Uh, it is a, it, it's something that is up for debate and you and your compliance officer, or your EPA investigator may disagree on it. Um, the enforcement memos give examples, but there are no specific standards. And then I provided what I think of is the, uh, the formula to keep in mind here. Uh, when an agency is using good faith enforcement discretion, plus you're dealing with a performance standard, which PSM and RMP are, you, uh, you end up with a lot of uncertainty. So you just need to accept that and, and know that you're, there's not going to be a lot of things you can know for certain. The last thing to consider here is uh, you are going to be subject to the whims of the regulators here. Um, good faith is very much going to be measured uh, and compared uh, by the last thing that your uh, investigator saw. If they were at the plant next door, down the road, or um, in another state, and they saw something they think is better, they're probably going to instantly think, well, you could be doing better. Maybe this isn't good faith. Um, so that's a, that's a hazard you may have to deal with, um, and that's one you might have to look at some of the other reference points that we included here on the left. Um, and the last concern then is that, that OSHA or EPA may just disagree with your baseline PSM or RMP compliance. Um, it's not unusual for the agency to inspect and to um, allege violations of a standard because they don't like what you're doing. So it's entirely possible that they don't, they're less concerned with your, your COVID um, restrictions and how you're complying today and more concerned with uh, your, your general level of compliance. Uh, you may find that that's where the disagreement goes. And so that's always a possibility and, and something you may run into with the um, inspections. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back over to Dylan for the uh, for the next section. Yeah, thanks, Micah. Man, really good stuff there. I love the legal side of things for sure. Um, all right, so because it's widely known that every good webinar just wouldn't be complete without a crazy analogy, we'll go there. All right, okay, so it's the beginning of the year and everything is looking up. The road ahead of us is clear. We're making good time. We're making good money, just easy rolling. Life at the plant just couldn't be better. And then bam, out of nowhere, we round this corner and we're in the middle of this dense fog patch, the COVID-19 fog patch. And the direction is no longer clear, right? And so what we suggest uh, as the vehicles for navigating your way out of that fog are employee participation in MOC. And so when I first got into PSM, someone explained to me that the order of the PSM elements were developed by industry and OSHA, it was no accident. And that's always stuck with me. The order is intentional. And that first element, employee participation, is ultimately what you rely on for the success of your program. Employee participation is your eyes and ears, your senses, if you will, uh, for your PSM program. And just like what would happen if, if you were a driver entering uh, that fog, uh, your senses would heighten and help you navigate the fog, come out safely on the other side. And so I think by extension, employee participation should be those eyes and ears of your COVID good faith effort. Uh, employee participation is listed first by OSHA because management cannot do PSM alone. Management cannot afford blind spots when it comes to PSM, and employee participation greatly reduces those. Now, my experience is, is that the idea of employee participation, it varies at different facilities. In some cases, a facility will have like SME teams that regularly meet to discuss PSM processes. In another case, in other cases, employee participation really just exists as a procedure in the PSM manual, which states employees participate in PHAs. In either case, though, you can leverage that strong employee participation program uh, that you have or use this good faith effort as the first step to building good employee participation. And so what better way to impress that OSHA auditor than to make your employee participation program the cornerstone of your good faith effort? Uh, we recommend establishing a COVID task force that's made up of your various SMEs at your facility, uh, engineering, operations, maintenance, HR, et cetera. And you need that diversity of thought and experiences and expertise from your key subject matter experts. By incorporating them, uh, your good faith effort is likely to be more thorough better documented and more creative. Um, and then more like more more departments are going to be likely to own that process. And by extension, employee buy-in is likely to be better. And all that's needed really is your quality leadership. And that that leadership uh, starts with establishing a good charter for your COVID-19 uh, task force so that the focus is on what needs to be accomplished. 
Now that charter uh, may be a bit more broad to address overall impacts of COVID-19 or just those specific to PSM RMP. But from our perspective, from our, our, our PSM expertise expect, uh, perspective, at a minimum, we certainly want to address PSM and RMP. And that involves first and foremost preventing the release of highly hazardous chemicals. And then by extension, the goal is protecting employees, public, and the environment. We will want to thoroughly document our careful evaluation of the COVID-19 impacts and then the efforts to mitigate them to demonstrate our good faith efforts. Uh, where traditional compliance is not feasible, we'll want to defer those time-based requirements. And those time-based requirements, as Micah mentioned, they may be OSHA mandated or defined by the ragged gap at your site, the recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices uh, that your site defined they want to follow, the code standards, recommended practices, as well as your internal requirements and deadlines. And that's why you'll absolutely need your SMEs to navigate the ragged gap and identify where exceptions, extensions, or risk-based decision-making uh, is defined. Because that ragged gap clause in PSM takes that four-page, four or five-page standard and blows it up into a thousand pages. So those SMEs are, are indispensable in understanding that. And then on top of that, you're going to need to understand the state and local rules. All right, so back to our fog analogy just real quick. What is going to cover you if you, if you get pulled over by the OSHA police there or, heaven forbid, you run off the road in that fog? Uh, what's going to protect you from those OSHA citations? Well, guess what? Your current PSM RMP program really has the perfect tool already to evaluate, implement, and document those good faith efforts. Man, it is your MOC process. And so, again, you're leveraging an existing uh, PSM program to navigate that COVID fog. And so what does your structure look like? Well, that, that can be a really different. Your MOC structure can vary based on uh, your facility system to handle MOCs uh, and, and the changes that you, the impacts that you identify. Um, so careful evaluation of how you structure that MOC, whether it be a single umbrella MOC or a parent-child MOC or multiple MOCs, temporary, permanent, a mix of that uh, is really up to that facility, but you should definitely pick uh, an MOC format that that uh, is appropriate. Your MOC could be potentially large, and your task force should make sure that it captures the impacts and changes uh, to the PSM RMP uh, programs due to the quote unquote new normal, right? And so these things might include like rate changes due to like reduced demand, organizational changes from less folks on site, temporary procedures, delayed PMs, the list goes on. Uh, and, and one thing that you should consider is, are, it, it, does your current MOC process have the checklist to evaluate this situation? Uh, and so, as I said before, one of the things we want to provide you with is a checklist to address COVID, and, and we're really looking forward to your input on, on making, on strengthening that checklist. Um, and then one of the hidden values of an MOC is they often serve as a roadmap for future projects. And, and in this case, it can serve as a roadmap if we ever run into this situation again. And because this is one of those potential roadmap MOCs, we recommend having a post-mortem analysis on how that MOC went uh, and some suggestions on what we could do better or differently in the future. Um, so talk about thorough, right? Your OSHA auditor will be oppressed if you, if you leverage these two elements to kind of found your good faith efforts. Now, let's take a quick look at, uh, not a quick look, but a more detailed approach in evaluating risk associated with those impacts. All right, thank you, Dylan. And going along with your analogy, buckle up, because we have a lot of information to go through. So I will be talking pretty quickly. That being said, the slides that you will see here are pretty text heavy, and this was intended because we hope that if you find this logic useful, we want you to be able to reference back to the slides as needed. And definitely don't hesitate to reach out after the webinar. Okay, so you may be facing at this point in time or already have faced the possibility of having to defer various action items and tasks across your facility due to the pandemic because of lack of resources, contractors, reduced budgets, or delayed turnarounds. Now, as mentioned, simply stating that you have delayed such items due to COVID likely will not meet the good faith operations that OSHA and the EPA expect. Therefore, a good faith tool for such deferrals maybe risk-based decision-making, which we will present here. Risk-based decision-making should follow Raggy Gap where possible, but where you cannot due to the current situations, 
You need to comply with as much as you can and document any gap with the justification. If your facility chooses to use risk-based decision-making, it is highly recommended to leverage the COVID-19 task force that Dylan mentioned. And the task force should follow this recommended process, thus ensuring employer participation. So first, the task force should identify impacts to items that are linked to PSM RMP elements. Second, establish the risk evaluation logic that meets a good faith effort. Third, apply that approved logic, and we will talk about those three recommended uh, risk-based decision-making items here. Next, use the risk rank evaluation to decide if you need to delay any items, if you should go ahead and move ahead with an item, if the risk cannot be accepted, maybe you need to put some mitigation measures into place. Finally, document the evaluation results and decision made using the MOC process. To discuss risk-based decision-making options, we're gonna walk through a hypothetical situation. Your facility had a turnaround scheduled for spring 2020. Due to COVID, the turnaround got pushed to spring 2021, so in a year. Your task force reviews the turnaround listing and identifies the following items that are listed here. These items may be overdue currently or will be overdue if they're pushed to the spring 2021 turnaround. We don't know. The task force decides to apply approved risk evaluation methodologies based on the type of item. So items one and two are related to MI and preventative maintenance. So the good faith risk evaluation will leverage RBI logic. Items three and four should already have a risk evaluation that simply needs to be reviewed. And items five and six potentially do not have a risk evaluation. So the task force determines to use a simplified risk making on these. And we'll walk through these, these three items. The first risk evaluation methodology we will discuss is risk-based inspection, RBI. However, before jumping into it, I want to refer back to one of Micah's comments that MI is generally not covered by the enforcement discretion memo. So you're probably saying, why are we even talking about this here? Well, RAGAGAP, API 510 in this case, allows for deferral. So if you are faced with deferring a fixed equipment inspection, the simplest tool in your toolbox, and it's not even risk-based decision-making, is the API 510 Simplified Deferral. The requirements of such include that the inspection must not have previously been deferred, and the deferral will not increase the due date by 10% or six months, whichever is less. Okay, if the Simplified Deferral does not apply to your equipment, then you can look into leveraging the API 510 deferral, which includes, at a minimum, a documented risk assessment or an update to an existing RBI assessment to determine if the proposed deferral date would increase risk above an acceptable thresh threshold that's defined by your facility. So the objective of RBI is to determine the consequence of an incident in the event of equipment failure and how likely it is that that incident could happen. This is risk. The process involves detailed studies and a multidisciplinary team neither of which you potentially have the luxury of having right now. So we'll be discussing how to leverage the RBI logic in a good faith manner to potentially defer inspections during these times. We will call this good faith RBI throughout here, but it is a risk assessment, which is allowed under the API 510 deferral. The core components listed here on the right should look familiar to, to most PSM professionals. So we'll use this presented flow to discuss good faith RBI in contrast to typical RBI. Now, to satisfy any MI professionals joined in on this call, I want to address the fact that what we are calling good faith RBI is not actual RBI. I am not suggesting that the methodology presented here be utilized outside of the COVID situation we are in. We are in. That being said, the good faith RBI is a risk assessment that follows the process of RBI. So let's walk through these steps. The first piece of RBI is collecting and validating data. The data listed here will be leveraged in the good faith RBI as well as a standard RBI. And your facility should already have this information. So there's really no good faith logic to apply here. You should have it. The next part of the, RB, the good faith RBI and standard RBI is identifying causes and the probability of each cause. In the interest of time, I'm not going to speak to the actual RBI logic that's there on the left, but I pre presented it here and on subsequent slides. So you can look back on any similarities and differences. Because the identification of the cause is typically handled in a damage mechanism study, 
For your COVID deferral, assume the most obvious damage mechanism and failure mode for the equipment in question. Then leverage the equipment's inspection history to determine the probability of the cost. Equipment and similar service will be your friend here too. So don't forget to reference back to that. Additionally, it is recommended to take into account the remaining life of the equipment. This is important because if you're operating at half-life, the probability of failure is already significant and therefore you should be inspecting it more often. So the example, our accumulator that, that was supposed to be in our turnaround is presented here in orange. So just real quickly, it's carbon steel, contains flammable hydrocarbons. The most obvious cause determined by our task force is external corrosion, resulting in localized thinning, resulting in a small leak. Our task force says, oh, our inspector says it has an above average corrosion rate higher than accumulators and similar service. So the probability of the cause, the leak, is assigned as 0.3 times per year. Now, note, this is arbitrary. My example here is very arbitrary. If you choose to utilize good faith, you need to use your facility's probability guidance, for example, from a LOPA, as well as rely on the subject matter expert. Now that we have the cause, we can move on to identifying credible consequence scenarios that result from the cause. Simplifying the RBI methodology for good faith RBI, assume the most obvious consequence for the equipment, then leverage your facility's PHA and or risk matrix to assign a severity. Finally, leverage operational knowledge to determine the probability of the consequence. I find this best evaluated using a simplified event tree. Unfortunately, we couldn't fit it into the slides, so we will have it as one of the handouts later this week. Putting this logic to our example, because the accumulator contains hydrocarbons, the most obvious consequence is fire, with the worst case severity being equipment damage and personnel injury. So based on your fictitious company severity guidance, the severity is assigned to four. And there's steps that you go through to determine the probability. So talk about probability of ignition. Are there gonna be people in the area? Assign probabilities to those. And then you multiply the probability of the cause determined in the previous slide by these consequence probabilities resulting in a total probability. So in this case, that total probability is 0.021 times per year. We are finally at the point where we can determine the overall risk. Because we are simplifying this for our good faith operations, let's use our facility's fictitious risk matrix. This is just a generic one out there. And chart the severity and probability we have already determined in the previous slide. So as you can see here, our resulting risk ranking is a three. Circling back to why we are even doing this in the first place, our goal is not the same as the goal of a standard RBI. We are trying to determine if the equipment is acceptable to operate between now and the next available inspection date based on our risk assessment. We have our risk ranking, but what does that mean in relation to the inspection deferral? So our fictitious internal guidance for our facility states that risk rank three items must be corrected within two years meaning that your facility accepts the risk of operating with the risk rank three item for two years. So our deferred due date is two years from the original due date. And the risk is determined by our task force to be acceptable between now and the next shutdown. Okay, so we finished item one, the internal on the accumulator. Now I promise the rest of this will not take as long. With the first turnaround item reviewed, we move into item number two, which is the furnace shutdown PM. Note that API 510, five, excuse me, 580 includes rotating equipment in the scope. So this outline good faith RBI can be used for rotating equipment PMs. However, instrumentation is not included in the scope of 580. But ISA 61511, which is the standard for safety instrumented systems, states that suitable management procedures shall be applied to review deferrals. So your suitable management procedure during COVID could be the outline good faith RBI. So here you'll see the step-by-step -step process for identifying the cause, consequence, probabilities, and severity. I'm not going to read all this to you, but it's definitely worthwhile to read back to if you are in a place where you need to defer some instrumentation proof tests or PMs. Okay, so now that we completed items one and two, which were the MI PM items on our turnaround list using the RBI logic, we can turn to items three and four, which are already risk ranked. The easiest risk ranking to tackle is the risk ranking that has already been determined for you. 
So leverage this risk ranking and determine if the implementation of these items can be pushed out within the bounds of your facility's risk acceptance guidance and use it to compare to others. Now, I'm not going to talk through these in the interest of time, but please feel free to refer back. Okay, reflecting back to our turnaround list again, now we need to tackle items five and six, which were not restrained. These items, an incident action item and a release systems revalidation concern were simply labeled as fix at the next opportunity. Assigning a risk ranking to such items not only aids in your site during normal operation, but will aid in planning during pandemic response. Therefore, for good faith efforts, the task force decides to apply a simplified risk ranking logic and then applies increased scrutiny on higher ranked concerns. So on the next slide, there it is. We have an example of a simplified risk ranking methodology. Now, I'm just gonna talk really quickly through this. The, the first red diamond is weeding out any low likelihood type of items. For example, fire, low likelihood, risk rank at a one. Then estimate the maximum pressure of the associated equipment during the event. If the estimated pressure is less than hydro test, that's a low consequence, weed it out, risk rank one. Then use your internal guidance for assigning consequences and assumed probabilities and determine your risk ranking. If your risk is low or medium low, use that risk ranking. If it is higher than that, refer back to your, to your PHA, or maybe you wanna consider bringing together a small hazard review team to evaluate the true risk of it. Okay, so here's our two examples, our incident action items on the left, our PSCs on the right. We have applied the risk ranking to both of these. The incident was determined to be a risk rank three, um, and excuse me, a risk rank two. So you have in your fictitious world, three years from identification, so you can push it out to the next turnaround. Unfortunately, our PSV was risk ranked a three, and it is actually currently overdue. So your task force says, we need to apply interim mitigation measures, and this needs to be figured out how to be completed on the run. In the next slide, we have the table. So the task force sits down and says, we've confirmed our risk ranking, we've modified the due dates, we still have two go dues we have to handle, that audit action item and replacing the PSB. But that is a much shorter go do list than if you're trying to tackle all your turnaround items. But most importantly, your facility operated in good faith to ensure there's not additional risk in pushing back that turnaround. Lastly, on the next slide, the task force should not perform these evaluations in isolation. You need to use your SMEs and you need to use your MOC process to document that result. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to Dylan to discuss if some of the elements are virtually impossible. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. Some, some really good stuff there. And I guarantee you, if your COVID task force uh, takes those, the, the deferrals, those evaluation deferrals to that level, uh, you will have clearly demonstrated good faith effort. Um, so, yeah, we'll take it back here to the 10,000 foot, foot view and finish this webinar up and get to y'all's questions. Um, so, so, what about what's virtually impossible and what's virtually possible? Uh, and we'll focus in here on the time based requirements. Um, you know, what do you do with PHAs? What do you do with training? compliance audits. What about your RMP submittal that's due every five years? Well, we, we really think there's not much reason to defer that uh, RMP submittals, but we'll get into the other three just a little bit. And then obviously, uh, mechanical integrity inspections, equipment inspections are just not, that's, that's something that's not there yet uh, from a virtual perspective. Um, so I think one of the most important things that, that we can really uh, look at is what, what others are doing uh, in in regards to these things. So as your as your COVID task force um, evaluates your PHAs, you know, you need to look at the pros and cons for those facilities. I mean, there are some pros to going virtual. virtual. Uh, number one is you'll meet the deadline defined uh, by the regulation. There's not going to be any travel costs associated if you're traveling facilitators. Uh, and consequently, you'll have better flexibility because the PHA schedule will not be hemmed in by travel schedule and it's just going to be easier to bring in experts into the virtual world that's already established than bringing them into the physical room through a virtual type of setup. It's just kind of awkward. The cons, everyone can multitask. Now, I know that most of you doing this webinar are multitasking right now. Probably 96.2% of you are, uh, which is fine. I mean, I get it. Get your stuff done, right? Uh, 
But when it comes to PHAs, that can be a real problem. And the facilitator has a lot less control in keeping the team focused and on task. So that is a concern. There's a potential for less engagement and consequently less creativity in developing those solution, solutions. Limited opportunity for field review, potentially limited access to PSI, depending on your site's technology situation. And then, of course, always those technology issues, uh, feedback and whatnot. Um, but so ultimately, each facility must weigh those site-specific uh, impacts. Now, you know, here's the big question. You know, will OSHA consider deferring the PHA as a good faith effort? Well, the memo covers this. They do say that deferral can be um, accomplished if you would bring in an outside facilitator and they couldn't come in for um, new travel restrictions and stuff like that. Uh, but it says that provided the employer considered alternative options for compliance. So is deferral good faith if you decide the virtual PHA isn't for you? I would argue that that's anyone guesses right guess right now because we won't know we won't know for sure how they'll enforce it and how those citations will be litigated. But I think we can get a pretty good idea by looking at what our industry peers are doing. So we do a lot of PHAs at Providence, a lot. Um, and, and so far, our anecdotal, our anecdotal experience is that business is booming. We have not had a single client delay their P PHAs. Um, and mostly because we have awesome facilitators. But, but really, they've moved them all to virtual. So if 95% of the industry is moving to virtual and you don't, I would suggest that your facility document the clear and special circumstances that exist at your facility that make the virtual PHA impractical. Uh, you may try things like a pilot, just see how it goes. We, we've been surprised at, at how easily people transition to the virtual PHA. Um, and then you might consider some policies like cameras on to ensure engagement, so, such like that. Um, and if you still choose to defer, you might prioritize based on overdue PHA, but I would also recommend looking at the risk indicators as well uh, that already exist in your PHA process. Uh, so again, that's just covering the basis of thorough documentation and good faith effort. Training, I'll go over this quickly. Um, training, computer-based, obviously don't don't defer that. Uh, and then the candidates for deferral are really your hands-on training or classroom tr training that you can't immediately adapt to online. Uh, again, try to prioritize those deferred trainings based on risk. And you've got, uh, you've got a number of indicators for that that you can leverage. And then if you get, end up getting in a sticky situation, uh, you can always resort to the EPA memo that basically states, hey, the EPA believes that it's the most important uh, to keep experienced trained operators on the job, even if you miss a, a training or a certification. So that's critical. Leverage that to your advantage. I'll jump into compliance audits here real quick. Um, you can pretty much do everything remotely in a compliance audit, uh, except for the field reviews. Now, I'd argue you lose some quality, especially, especially in the interviews, because so much of that's building rapport. Uh, with that person in a face-to-face -face interview, and you end up getting some good information and are able to, ha to have a higher quality audit. But you definitely can't do the field reviews. Um, so you do have some options. You can do a partial deferral where you complete everything but the field, the field walk down. You issue a provisional report to comply with that uh, three-year date, and then you go back and you, and you uh, amend that report once COVID is, is vanquished and you can do the field, field walk down. In the meantime, you're correcting your deficiencies as soon as possible uh, and demonstrating a good faith effort. And then again, if you go full deferral, you just need to document your, your facility's special circumstance. Um, and then there's some other elements that, that aren't, that aren't time-based but could still be affected. And I won't go through them here right now, but, but just know we're going to put together that checklist for you uh, of the ideas that we had for evaluation. Um, and so, please, we really hope that uh, you can, can contribute to that uh, with your ideas um, re regarding this. Yeah, so, so what now? Well, if, if you haven't yet documented your current good faith efforts from the shutdown back in March, you know, it's a good time to put that together. And perhaps more importantly, though, you'll want to be prepared if we get a second wave of this stuff and have subsequent ma mandated shutdowns. And so, I just want to thank you all for joining us today, and, and I hope that we've provided you some good information on how to navigate this COVID-19 fog. Uh, 
And please, please, please tell us what you think. We're all about taking in that feedback and improving our webinars that we deliver to you all. Um, I'll hand this back to Heather now for questions. Thank you guys so much. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, so we really appreciate it. Please continue to send in your questions. I've gotten quite a few here. Uh, whatever we do not get a chance to answer in the next couple of minutes, we will send out uh, to everybody um, so that you see all the questions and answers. So please, it's not wasted. If you have to throw in a question and, and pop out, we understand. Um, I do have a couple uh, questions here that I'd like to go ahead and get y'all's take on. Uh, first, this was asked um, during Micah's section at the beginning. Um, so I think Micah and probably Lauren might have a good insight on this. Um, given uh, the five-year PHA revalidation, um, there could be an issue where you cannot access the previous PHA files due to the social distancing and off-site situation going on. Uh, this particular uh, situation, they've done a temporary MOC and a variance, uh, and they're reviewing incidents and MOCs over the last five years, as well as citing and human factor checklists. Do you think this is a sufficient amount of effort to demonstrate good faith for that um, that variance in that potential difference of that PHA? Yeah, so that, that sounds like a, a pretty good attempt at, at um, demonstrating that, that it's impossible, right? And, and then doing a few things to, um, to, to check and, and, and see what you can do. Um, I think that, I just wanna focus on one element there, which I think is gonna be important in that uh, it's, it's sort of in the good faith analysis, but it's also related to the reasons you can't comply. If you literally can't access the former PHA documentation, uh, that's almost a lock, right? That that is that's one of the best excuses I've ever seen of uh, why you why you can't get this done. Now, be prepared for tough questions about you mean literally no one can get there? No, there's no one can go in the office. Like, well, what is the obstacle? So, be ready for tough questions. Um, the only extra thing that I would suggest in terms of of good faith. Um, would would just be um, focusing on um, any any changes that have occurred since the last PHA, right? If you are able to um, document those changes, and if you're you're able to at least in a in a rough estimate figure out whether the changes that have happened in your process in the five years since the last PHA, if you can figure out if they may increase the hazard or or have not. Um, if they have increased the hazards, can you check quickly to see if they've been, those hazards have been well addressed with new safeguards? I think that's that last piece that, that will just almost certainly put you over the top. That if you can show that you, you can't access the former PHA and you can show we've looked to see if anything has changed to create new hazards, either there were no changes or um, all the changes have sufficient safeguards, that's a just about an ironclad case for um, for good faith in that in that instance. Fantastic, uh, Lauren. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I think Micah addressed it appropriately. Fantastic. Um, I will ask one more question before we go here today. Uh, the question was for you, Dylan, um, talking about PHAs and possibly doing them remotely. What solutions uh, do you think uh, you could offer for operators that do not have PCs um, for them to be able to participate in PHAs? Uh, what, what kind of solutions could you offer? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I mean, the first the first comes to mind does the site have any resources where they could make available to that operator as far as laptops and, and whatnot? That's that's where my mind goes to first, and then and then second, uh, if you go through a consultant, um, you know, there may be a possibility for that the consultant to uh, to lend out a laptop to make that possible. Um, so yeah, it's all about technology access, right? And and internet access may be a problem for some folks, um, and so I think. I think, and Micah can correct me if I'm wrong, but those type of challenges, if you document them well and and uh, to the point where you can really respond to those tough questions as to why it wasn't possible, I think that really documents your your good faith efforts. But you know, maybe it may be difficult to to truly demonstrate that uh, that there's just no way to get technology to that person. Wonderful. 
Well, I think that's all we have time for today. I appreciate everybody who stuck around a couple extra minutes. Uh, we will go ahead and get some answers to all the other questions and I will stick around online here and leave the leave the, the webinar open for any further uh, questions. If you wanna take a few minutes and, and send that in, how all, you can also feel free to email any of the participants at the emails on the screen or at sales at propsm.com and we will make sure that we get uh, information back to you guys. We really do appreciate all of you today and thank you all so much. We'll be in touch with um, a copy of the Q&A answers, uh, a way to access the recorded webinar and those supplemental materials that Dylan, Lauren, and Micah mentioned. So thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Hello. Yeah, if you can leave it there, I just sent out a little message that I was gonna leave it till 2.10 unless everybody leaves. There's only four left and one of them's a Trinity person. So, um, but I have gotten uh, quite a few messages and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so if you don't mind just leaving it up there a few more minutes, oh, we've only got two left. I appreciate it, thank you. Good God. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we've got one left in here. Just, I was going to throw you guys in a, I was going to call everybody on Teams here in a minute and just debrief real quick. So, okay. Bye.